Coming up on State of Events, President Trump is planning to meet with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. And today, the president arrives in California to address border security. State of Events starts now. Welcome to State of Events. I'm Veronica kunz -Verbong. And I'm Lauren G. Let's get to our top story. President Trump tweeted this morning that Rex Tillerson is no longer Secretary of State. CIA Director Mike Pompeo will replace him immediately. Tillerson got the news during an official tour of Africa. The former CEO of ExxonMobil arrived in Washington this morning and learned he had been fired. Tillerson and Trump did not agree on his decision to meet North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The White House says North Korea agreed to stop missile and nuclear testing. South Korea's National Security Advisor says Kim Jong-un is looking forward to the meeting. Trump tweeted, Great progress is being made, but sanctions with North Korea will remain. Some Congress members are worried that Trump will go off script and act impulsively when speaking to Kim. Yet some see it as a significant opportunity to talk about dismantling North Korea's nuclear program. A date for the meeting has not been set yet, but is currently in progress. Well, President Trump has a busy week this week. He's arriving in California today for the first time since winning the 2016 election. His short trip starts in San Diego to look at prototypes of borders along the Mexican border. He will also speak to troops at a nearby military base. From there, he'll head to Beverly Hills for a fundraiser before flying back to Washington on Wednesday. Trump is not planning to meet with any state leaders or tour parts of the valley. His visit comes a week after General che Jeff Sessions sued the state over immigration laws. And in the ongoing debate of gun control, President Trump is proposing a new gun and school safety legislation. These include tightening security on campuses, improving background checks, and changing parts of the mental health care system. Trump also suggested a committee char change chaired by Education Secretary Betsy DeVos that helps with school violence prevention. It does not include a plan to increase the age limit for buying certain guns. This comes more than three weeks after the Parkland school shooting in Florida. And the NRA is suing Florida after Governor Rick Scott signed a gun control bill on Friday. Senate Bill 7026 enacts a three-day waiting period and raises the age limit to buy firearms from 18 to 21 years old. The law also bans the sale of bump stocks and gives greater authority to judges to confiscate weapons from people who may be a threat. The NRA argues that the new law prohibits citizens to exercise the Second Amendment to bear arms, and they also claim that it violates the 14th Amendment as their right to citizens. As the NRA tries to block this new law, students from Stoneman Douglas High School believe that this law is only the beginning to creating stricter gun regulations. The NRA donated more than $7 million to schools across the U.S. for programs like rifle leagues, hunting teams, and junior reserves officer training corps. From 2010 to 2016, approximately 500 schools received donations, with California having the most funding. Florida came in a close second. Grants came in the form of safety equipment and rifles instead of cash. The killer from last month's shooting in Parkland, Florida, was on the school's rifle team in which the NRA funded. The Broward School District, where Stonesman High School belong, is the first to refuse funding from the NRA. Denver, Colorado also requested to stop receiving grants as well. Yet some other states are not backing away from the fundings. And back here in the Bay Area, a coffee shop in Oakland is refusing to serve police. A barista at Asta Muerte Coffee turned away a police officer who tried to order a coffee, saying their establishment doesn't serve police. Asta Muerte, Spanish for until death, is an employee-owned co-op in Fruitville. The building is covered with murals to memorialize Oscar Grant and others killed in police shootings. The Oakland police sent a letter asking for the coffee shop's reasoning. The shop did not respond directly, but instead in an Instagram post posted to their customers to talk to their neighbors, not the police. Staff asked the police officers to leave for the physical and emotional safety of their customers and themselves. The Oakland police are using this experience as an opportunity to say that they respect the business owner's right. And more with East Bay News. March is Women's History Month, and so Oakland hosted a gathering of hundreds of women marching in celebration of International Working Women's Day. It's a day marking protest against working conditions. The theme of the celebration was to rise for our communities, resist state violence, and unite for our right to dignified work. 
Thousands across the nation were striking against violence due to gender inequality in the workplace. There was also a speak out and a cultural program that featured immigrant working in Oakland. And in San Francisco, a federal judge dismissed a lawsuit accusing SF State officials of encouraging hostility towards Jews. The suit claims the university allowed anti-Semitism from the highest level. It comes in part from the disruption of a speech by Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat in April 2016. The federal judge says the plaintiffs can continue the suit if they file a convincing case within the next 20 days. And next on State of Events, find out what BART police are doing to enforce their new proof of payment policy. An SF State biology professor, Jonathan Stillman, is live in the studio to discuss environmental threats to San Francisco. Stay with us and we'll be right back. And a new bill might cost drivers more to get into downtown SF. The proposed congestion pricing program will require drivers to pay a toll to enter busy areas. It will also allow local jurisdictions to choose how much riders should pay to enter. The bill is backed up by State Senator Scott Weiner. A hearing for the proposal starts this weekend. And California's fast bullet train is coming slower than you think. The projected cost jumps to $77 billion. Its completion date is also pushed back another four years to 2033. The bullet train will connect riders from San Francisco to LA while making stops in Silicon and the Central Valley. When finished, it will carry passengers to and from North and Southern California in less than three hours. Reactions to the delay are mixed with some concerns over funding and secu security environmental clearance. The California High Speed Rail Authority hopes to get more money from private investors and legislatures. And Bart says the fare evaders are costing the system 15 to 20 million dollars a year. State of Events reporter Tyler McKinney has all the details on BART's new approach at cracking down on commuters who ride without paying their fair shares. Within the last year, BART has focused more on punishing riders who refuse to pay, also known as fair evaders. Once they get into the station, it's hard to distinguish them from paying customers. So last year, a policy was set in place for riders once getting past the opening gates. They are required to provide proof of payment when requested. They show either a BART card or a Clipper card to show that they have entered the system and processed their fare media to enter. But BART didn't stop there. They kicked it up a notch. Since January, fare inspectors are stationed at select BART stations. They use handheld readers to check tickets on platforms and inside the trains. Up until now, they've given out warnings to riders who don't pay to ride, but not anymore. The new proof of payment policy that began March 2nd is a lot more strict. Anyone caught without proof of payment will be issued a citation with initial fines of $75 for adults and $55 for minors. People will either pay the fine or they also have an option. Anybody can perform community service. BART police say that the presence of these fare inspectors alone will cut down on the amount of money caused by the lack of payments. Some are skeptical about the new policy, but according to BART, many commuters actually like the added layer of security. All they ask is that you pay your fair share. In San Francisco, I'm Tyler McKinney. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Tyler. Well, here's a little bit of good news for BART and uh, Caltrain drivers. Wi-Fi is coming to both cars, but there's a catch. Both transit agencies plan to add their Wi-Fi in the stations within the next four years. Too long. Officials say they will install the networks into the stations first before adding it onto the new cars. They also say the Wi-Fi will also help police communication, maintenance, tracking, and mobile paying.
RVs are lining the streets surrounding San Francisco State University. With the cost of living increasing, many people are trying to find cheaper ways to lay their heads at night. Reporter Kelly DeLeon spoke with the SF State student who made the decision to invest in an RV. Adele Niazi is a 22-year-old transfer student at SF State who is living out of his RV while he finishes up college. I could have lived here with a roommate, um, but even then, the money that I'd be spending on rent is just going to rent and it's not an investment. Living out of a trailer does come with its own expenses, but compared to rent in SF, there's an exceptional difference. The two major expenses is insurance uh, and repairs. And of course, tickets, if he forgets to move his RV for street cleaning. You're allowed to park on the streets 24 hours, except that one hour per week that there is street cleaning in. Although Nayazi's place is not luxurious, it offers him the comfort and protection he needs. It's literally just somewhere to lie down, shut my eyes for a little bit of time, and, and then wake up and get back to work. If anybody needed a place to stay or you know, put their head down for a little bit, just come in here and, you know, um, my home is your home, and my home is on the street of SF. <laughs> in San Francisco, the average price to rent a one-bedroom apartment is $3,000. However, the city provides the greatest opportunity for academic and entrepreneurial advancements. For this inherent catch-22, an RV seems to be the greatest compromise. In San Francisco, I'm Kelly DeLeon with State of Events. You know, that sounds like a good idea. It's starting cheaper and cheaper, you know? Yeah, it's a really good alternative. Instead of paying rent, yeah. you can just live in an RV. Yeah, but my question is, where? how does he do laundry? Where does he go? Yeah, like, <laughs> I don't, saying. yeah. I, I think it might be a little bit cold in there, too, especially in San Francisco. Well, coming up on State of Events, the Bay Area is sinking. And it's slow, but it's happening. More details after the break. Stay with us. What is sustainability? Sustainability? Yeah, sustainability. Well, it's composting. Cool. It's conserving water. What about clothes? You can you reuse clothes too. Are you ready for school? Almost done. Well, the number one search engine is back at it again. Google shells out some big and bold changes to its features, and it's also assisting the Pentagon. State Events reporter Sarah Sullivan is in studio to tell us more on what Google is up to this week. Sarah? Thanks, Verani. For this week's BizTech Roundup, Google is putting its focus on devices flown in the air. From airline flights to its drone technology, Google is going for it all. Google's search feature Google Flights is one of many sites that compares and tracks flight and hotel prices. Now it's coming out with new features no other website or airline app can compare to. Google announced that it is planning on adding a new notification feature on Google Flights that will allow users to know when their flight is delayed before the airline does. Google is positive they can make accurate notifications on flight statuses by using historical data and knowledge of current conditions to determine the likelihood of a flight's arrival time. Even if there is an 80% chance of delay, Google Flights would still notify the traveler on its predictions. But Google is not only helping users with their flight troubles, but now the Pentagon as well. That's right, Google CEO Sundar Pichai confirms that the company is providing artificial intelligence software tools to the Department of Defense for analysis of military drone footage. Google is providing computer systems called TensorFlow APIs. These systems will enable the military to run through the drone's footage, identify the object of interest, and then flag it for a trained human analysis to look over. Now, while this may seem like good news for the Department of Defense, Google has said that the partnership with the Pentagon is just a pilot and that its tools are for non-offense uses only. And that's it for this week's BizTech Roundup. I'm Sarah Sullivan. Back to you guys at the desk.
Thanks, Sarah. Well, sea levels are rising due to climate change and are threatening the Bay Area. But now, a recent study shows that the area is also sinking. Sarah Cabarizzo has a story. The Bay Area is sinking, and not only because of the rise in the sea level. A new study proves that the land is also going down. UC Berkeley's Roland Bergman, co-author of the paper, explains that this is due to a phenomenon called subsidence. So subsidence, we refer to essentially sinking land. The study combines the effect of different sea rise level scenarios with the rates of land subsidence in the Bay Area. So depending on which of these sea level rise scenarios you use, the added area that would be flooded because of the sinking uh, ranges from just a few percent to as much as almost double. However, some places are in a higher risk than others. The average sinking rate for the whole Bay Area is about 2 millimeters per year. But there are certain places like Treasure Island or San Francisco Airport where that rate goes up until 10 millimeters every year, and that's about half an inch. These areas sink way faster because of different factors. One is they, they are already lying very low lying. Right? They're just sticking a few feet um, above uh, current sea level. So it doesn't take that much to get yeah. them uh, underwater. And they subside especially fast. So in those areas, we see rates that are as fast as a centimeter per year, so nearly half an inch per year. That's a lot. Subsidence cannot be stopped itself. And it's hard to find other solutions for a developed area like San Francisco Bay. The most consistent option in the short run will be building seawalls, a solution especially suitable for San Francisco Airport, one of the infrastructures on highest risk. In San Francisco, this is Sara Cabrerizo for Institute of Events. To talk more about this, we got reporter Gabby Gephardt live in studio this morning with a special guest to give you an underwater breakdown of the San Francisco Bay. All right, guys. Well, this morning I am joined with Jonathan Stillman, and he is a professor of biology here at our own San Francisco State University. He has a PhD in zoology and a bachelor's of science in ecology, evolution, and behavior. So he is here now today to discuss the environmental physiology of organisms and the ecosystem's response to environmental change. So how are you doing today, Jonathan? I'm great, Gabby. Thanks for having me. Of course. We're so glad you could be here. So one thing I really wanted to dive into first is to talk about what are the main problems affecting the ocean? You know, is it like climate change? Is it a rise in the temperature? So yeah. you could break down. Absolutely. So there's uh, a number of different changes that are happening in the ocean as a result of what people are doing on this planet. We're putting more CO2, carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere, and that's causing the oceans to warm and also to acidify. So it's changing the chemistry of the oceans. We're also polluting the oceans uh, in a lot of ways, adding plastics, adding runoff from fertilizers, for example. And, um, and we're, we're also moving things around. We're moving species from place to place through shipping and other activities. So we're changing the ocean in a lot of ways. Definitely. So what do you think is um, one of the main toxins that you are finding now in the ocean, even locally too? Well, so locally we're seeing a lot of toxins that are produced by phytoplankton, uh, very small microscopic organisms at the base of the food chain. And when the waters are warmer and when there's a lot of nutrients in the water, these organisms can grow to massive population sizes, millions and millions and millions of cells wow. in a very small volume of water. And when they get to be very dense, uh, sometimes they start making toxins like domoic acid, for example, and, uh, and when people, um, and when the, after the toxins are produced, mm -hmm. they accumulate in shellfish, and when people eat those shellfish, they can get very sick, something called paralytic shellfish poisoning. Mm, so what is, you know, one of the direct uh, organisms affected? So is it like crabs, like mussels, what kind of animal? Yeah, we've seen, uh, we've seen crabs be affected. Mm. Uh, mussels, a lot of times the toxins accumulate in those organisms and make them unsafe for people to eat. Uh, also abalone, a few years ago, abalone along our coast were devastated by uh, a toxin um, produced by phytoplankton and a lot of the abalone died. So if a human then goes to consume this, uh, how will they be affected? So paralytic shellfish poisoning is so named because people are actually paralyzed from eating these neurotoxins. Gosh. So the, the phytoplankton produce chemical compounds that are toxic to our nervous systems and, and basically can cause paralysis and even death. Oh my God. I mean, what happens when you go to the doctor? Like, is there anything that can happen? 
Well, that's a good question. I think it probably depends on the, the severity of poisoning. Uh, but the, the, the safest thing is to really watch out for uh, any kind of announcements about the safety of our shellfish and really take heed to that. So mm -hmm. if it's not safe to go out and eat the shellfish, absolutely don't go do it. Definitely. Okay. And then um, last one, what can the public do to maybe help this problem? Is there anything to do or are we, main, like, are we the problem? Doing this. Well, so the public can make informed choices about how they live. Mm -hmm. uh, they can vote and make informed choices about how they vote. Human, humanity has a huge challenge on its hands in that we're slowly poisoning our planet, the, the, the living ecosystem that our lives depend on. Mm -hmm. And we have to do things to stop burning fossil fuels, to stop polluting the environment, and to stop mm -hmm. over harvesting the environment. And it has to do with the way that we regulate um, our, um, our societies and the way that we think about e economics. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, is there anything else you want to quickly add? Um, one thing that viewers might not know about that's yeah. really interesting is a huge change in our kelp forest ecosystems right now mm -hmm. off our coast. There's basically no more kelp uh, mm -hmm. in the, the northern Sonoma coast anymore and Mendocino. And it actually started from when the Russian American trading company was here back in the early 19th century and they over harvested all the sea otters. So they removed all mm -hmm. the sea otters. And then more recently ocean warming and a viral disease killed all the sea stars. So the predator for sea urchins now gone allowed the sea urchin population to go crazy and they ate all the kelp. <laughs> And the entire ecosystem, the entire kelp forest ecosystem is gone wow. because of what humans did and because of climate change and because of diseases. All right, Jonathan. Well, we are going to save this for another time. We're going to do a whole other segment, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to say from all of us here, thank you so much for making time and coming live to our studio. We are going to post your information on our website. So if anybody watching wants to come check it out, office hours, visit you at the lab, that would be great. So. Great. Until next time, thank you, and we're going to send it back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, so. Gabby. No problem. Thank you, Gabby and Professor Stillman. That was so interesting. Imagine not being able to eat the seafood from the bay anymore. And even more, imagine not being able to fish on our piers because of global warming. Yeah. All of the oceans are just going to rise. Definitely, definitely. Well, I don't like to work for my food, but like just seeing all the different changes of happening, mm -hmm. like we really need to get it together and just really focus on... On, on our ecosystem because yeah. it affects everything. Um, I, we just need to work on it more. Next on State of Events, we'll take a closer look at why the Warriors are having a rough season and how the Niners are making moves in the off season. Stay with us, we'll be right back. I saw a sleeping bear, a grizzly bear. It was sleeping behind a tree, and I saw a real coyote. Even though the planet's spinning and you can't see it spinning, recycle things like boxes or something. And water helps the environment so everything can we save um, the live. No water fish could not live. I bet in the ocean. Or the beach. When I go to my grandma and grandpa's house, I can I walk there. Nothing would get water in her whole away and using them again. The scraps we can like make up. I like the plan. My future is now. 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 <laughs> After Tim McGraw collapsed on stage, he gave a big thumbs up to the paparazzi. And we have Bruno Mars on the spotlight for cultural appropriation. Here's Karen Rios with this week's Entertainment Roundup. Fun, you know, have fun. It might on this week's Entertainment stuff. Roundup, we're starting with a big thumbs up from Tim McGraw. During his concert in Ireland, he collapsed from dehydration. His wife, Faith Hill, then made the executive decision to stop the concert. After apologizing to the fans, she sang in cappella, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. The country star gave a big thumbs up, assuring his fans he is healthy once again. Singer Bruno Mars is raising a debate about being a culture appropriator. The web series Grapevine, that is based on African American matters, discussed the issue. He is racially ambiguous. He is not black. 
at all. And he plays up his racial ambiguity to be able to do what Jameer says, cross genres and go into different places. And you guys are bringing up Michael Jackson. Although people agree with Sirin, many African-American artists like Charlie Wilson, Ninth Wonder, and others defended the 24 karat magic artist. Ninth Wonder argues that Bruno Mars should not be blamed for being influenced by African-American artists. Charlie Wilson also tweeted in his friend's honor and says that he is pulling inspiration from genres before him and continues to say he is doing a damn great job of bringing it back. That's all for this week's Entertainment Roundup. Stay tuned for more next week. I'm Karen Rios for State of Events. Well, thanks, Karen. Well, spring sports are in full swing, so let's see what happened this week. Britta Larson has this week's Sports Roundup. Britta? Thanks, guys. Let's see what our Bay Area teens were up to this week. The Warriors had a rough weekend after losing two games in a row to both Portland and Minnesota. They're, no doubt they're feeling the absence of Steph Curry, who was considered day-to-day -day after injuring his ankle in the first quarter of the game against San Antonio. The 49ers made another offseason move in signing Seattle, former Seattle Seahawks cornerback Richard Sherman to a three-year deal worth $39 million. Sherman played for the Seahawks from 2011 to 2017 before the team released him. The A's added veteran presence to their roster in signing catcher Jonathan Lucroy to a one-year $6.5 million contract. He previously played for the Milwaukee Brewers, the Texas Rangers, and most recently, the Colorado Rockies. The Giants had quite the weekend, winning split-squad games against the Angels on Saturday and beating the Padres on Sunday with a grand slam from Hunter Pence. That's all for this week's sports coverage. Thanks, Britta. Yeah, thanks. I, I'm still surprised that we got we got Sherman on, on our team. You know, it like, happened only one day after the Seahawks released him. The 49ers signed yeah. him the next day. Yeah, so it's $39 million. Is that like a lot, a lot? I or mean, is it's that over like, three years, but that's still a lot. I mean, that's, that's still, still a lot. lot. I mean, we're never going to get that much money, but like, is that, is that still it's a, a good It's deal? a lot. That's a, good thing. that's a good deal. Yeah, well, speaking of good deals, this month there's a lot of good things happening. We got tomorrow 3.14 pie day happening. Get your pie. Yep. Um, what else is happening? What else? Spring break is spring happening. Break. Do you guys break. have any plans? Any plans for spring break? Nothing yet. Nothing? <laughs> Nothing. I'm going to Portland, Oregon. So you're going up north? I'm yeah, going down south. I'm going to LA. So. Too bad the Sorry. bullet train that's supposed to be made isn't going to be made in time. Get it together, y'all. <laughs> well, thanks for watching State of Events in studio. I'm Veronica Kunzervong. And I'm Lauren G. We hope you have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next time.